In April of 2006, the small town of Medicine Hat woke up to some terrible news. Three members of the Richardson family had been murdered, with their second child missing. Now, we all hold our own perceptions of what a spree killer looks like, and nobody expected that the family's young, innocent daughter could be in on this terrible crime. But as you will soon discover, there were many awful thoughts and motives unfurling behind the eyes of this child. This case is a strange one to say the least. It features the internet from the mid-2000s, an extremely questionable romance, and apparently 300-year-old werewolves. Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, folks. My name is Adrian, and welcome back to another video by Coffeehouse Crime. Today we're looking at the case of the Richardson family. Now it must be said, but Coffeehouse Crime does more than just coffee. I also do true crime and strange cases here weekly. So if that's your sort of thing, please consider subscribing to the channel. Anyway folks, let's get straight into today's video. So please, grab yourself a coffee, buckle up, and get ready for the deep dive. This is the case of the Richardson Family Massacre. Coffeehouse crime is no stranger to Canada, as several of our stories are from this country, and today will be no different. We're zoning in on the small city of Medicine Hat, located 200 miles or 300 kilometers southeast of Calgary. Dubbed Canada's sunniest city, Medicine Hat is a clean and affluent area. And in true Canadian fashion, when I started researching this city, the first thing to appear on the map was the local Tim Hortons. Medicine Hat is a bustling community, popular with young budding families, has an outdoor-centered lifestyle, and has plenty of natural beauty and things to do. And one of those families fortunate enough to enjoy all this town has to offer was the Richardson family. Comprised of parents Deborah and Mark Richardson, their 8-year-old son Tyler, and 12-year-old daughter Jasmine. The family were described as the epitome of an average family, and in 1990, Deborah and Mark met at their local gym club in Ontario. They both attended the gym's weekly classes, one of which helped people with substance abuse. Unfortunately, Mark had previously suffered from an addiction to illegal substances. But by the time the pair had met, they were both sober and moving on with their adult lives. And after relocating and buying their first home together in Medicine Hat, they welcomed their first child, Jasmine. Four years later, and her little brother Tyler followed. The small family lived peacefully in their modest home in Medicine Hat. Both children were healthy and well-loved, and Jasmine and Taylor excelled in their education. And in fact, at the age of 11, Jasmine was already considered an honor student. She was young, pretty, and had an infectious smile, a trait many said she had inherited from her mother. Now unfortunately, this is where our story begins to nosedive slowly. As with many teenagers, but Jasmine's personality began to change as she reached her teenage years. Where she began the second decade of her life as a smiling, church-going honor student, things quickly started to change after she found the world of the internet. She initially remained bubbly and friendly in real life, but online she took a completely different persona to what she portrayed to her family and her friends. Jasmine had personal accounts on several social networking sites, which included MySpace at the time, and where her MySpace account used to appear tame and girly, it slowly transitioned into a darker and more gothic profile. Now, there's nothing wrong with that, but it's crucial context for today's video. She also created an account on the more obscure and now defunct social networking site VampireFreaks.com. Vampire Freaks was created for the sole purpose of connecting with other people in the goth, punk, and emo subcultures, and this was a place that Jasmine had found personal interest in. She went by the usernames such as X Killer Kitty X, Runaway Devil, and X Mayhem X. And for those who remember the young days of the internet, the use of X's was pretty much a product of its time. Her profiles were filled with pictures of her donning thick eyeliner, wearing alternative clothing, and posing with fake guns. And the interests listed on her social media descriptions matched quite clearly. Jasmine listed her interest with things like piercings, tattoos, Tim Burton, toy guns, and loud music, which of course was very typical for a budding emo teen in the mid-2000s. The Nightmare Before Christmas was all the rage, and Hot Topic was still devoid of Funko Pops. Now, Jasmine spent a lot of her time online talking to other alternative teens, but alongside this, she also frequented various alternative shows playing in the local area. These shows were generally centered around young people, so 12-year-old Jasmine usually went in a group with some of her friends. 
And unfortunately, this is where the story takes another wrong turn. It's at one of these punk rock shows that Jasmine crossed paths with a 23-year-old who went by the name of Jeremy Steinke. And Jeremy was, by all means, a deadbeat. After being heavily bullied, he dropped out of high school. But after this moment, he refused to find work, and instead lived in a trailer park with his mother. His mother suffered from alcohol abuse and struggled to maintain a stable relationship, which meant that men constantly came in and out of Jeremy's family home. Sadly, many of these men didn't take kindly to Jeremy either, and he often found himself physically abused by his mother's lovers. In 2006 and 23 years old at the time, Jeremy was unemployed and spent most of his time talking to girls online, most of whom were much younger than him. Jeremy described himself as somewhat of a freak, and all of his friends around him would echo a self-description, which makes sense as Jeremy told his friends several bizarre facts about himself. He told them he liked the taste of blood, and even drank it regularly. In addition to this, Jeremy was often seen with a vial of blood around his neck, just in case he ever got a so-called craving. Stranger still, Jeremy claimed that he was a 300-year-old werewolf, and while this sounds intriguing, Medicine Hat has had countless full moons with zero casualties, so I'm calling bullshit on this one. Jasmine met Jeremy at a local punk rock show where she told him that she was 15 years old, but in fact she was only 12 at the time. Either way, 15 is still a minor, but this didn't seem to phase Jeremy. He actually preferred younger girls, as they were easier to manipulate and control. The pair exchanged messages on various social media sites, including Vampire Freaks and the Canadian social networking site Nexopia, where Jasmine's age was still listed as older than she actually was. Over the following months, the two began to speak more often and more intensely, and it was evident that Jeremy's lifestyle and interests were influencing the young 12-year-old Jasmine. And over these messages, things took a disturbingly romantic turn between the two. And for all intensive purposes, it appeared that Runaway Devil and Soul Eater were now a couple. I'll spare you most of the details, but an extract of one of his messages read, God, I can't get over not seeing or talking to you. I yearn to hear your soft, subtle voice, and long to be held in your arms wherever that may be. I don't care, there is not anything that could ever replace the way you make me feel. I miss you, I love you, and I wish that we could just go somewhere. In very 2000s fashion, he even slipped in a hugs and kisses at the end and a ruffle emoticon, finishing it off with, talk to you later, cuddle bunny. Along with these creepy, inappropriate messages, he also influenced Jasmine to take on a darker personality, and soon after this, she transitioned into a more gothic lifestyle. It even went so far that, as a declaration of his love, Jeremy gifted his young girlfriend a vial of his very own blood, just like the one around his neck. And it didn't take long for this relationship to spill into real life, as Jasmine's parents became horrifically aware of their daughter's new adult boyfriend. They were understandably terrified for their daughter, and soon after learning about Jeremy, they swiftly grounded their daughter and took away her computer. However, after behaving for a while, this was returned to her. And do you think she ignored Jeremy afterwards? Of course not. The two reconnected, this time being more careful with concealing their relationship. The restrictions did not go unnoticed by Jeremy, however, and he was furious that Jasmine's parents were getting in the way between the two. In his own dark, edgy way, he expressed his anger through poetry, writing the following. My lover's rents are totally unfair. They don't know what is going on and just assume. She is slowly going insane. She continues to thank that I came. Their throats I want to slit. They shall pay for their insolence. Finally, there will be silence. Their blood shall be payment. This notion that the pair could not be together while Jasmine's parents were in the picture was echoed by both her and Jeremy. They would joke about somehow getting rid of them and living together indefinitely, and this was reflected in one of Jasmine's messages. In her message, she said, I miss you more than killing people. Can we get together and kill people? Rar, I hate them. So I have this plan. It begins with me killing them and ends with me living with you. Now, teenagers often joke about hating their parents, and it's not uncommon for them to sometimes wish they would disappear. But these words were falling on the ears of an obsessive predator, hell-bent on keeping Jasmine's affections. And whether or not Jasmine truly meant the words she was typing is unknown. But at least in Jeremy's mind, the idea of killing for his so-called lover was morbidly romantic. The Richardson family carried on about their daily lives. 
Mark and Deborah were happy that their daughter seemed to have taken a turn for the better, and their son Tyler was now attending school too, living the average innocent life of a happy eight-year-old boy. But very little did they know, through a computer screen, that their demise was being meticulously planned, and one of their killers would be their own flesh and blood. On the chilly spring day of April 23rd, 2006, the suburban neighbourhood of Southview was enjoying a sleepy Sunday. Many families were going about their daily routines, and with it being a Sunday, the kids were out to play. This included one young boy, who headed out to play with his friend Tyler. But upon knocking on the door of number 304, only silence responded. This struck the boy as strange. Not only were the Richardsons always home on Sundays, but the car was on the front drive too. So in a very expected, curious manner, the boy left the porch to peer through the window to his left, which looked into the home's basement. And upon peering into the dimly lit room, he could see the silhouette of a person lying on the floor. And concerningly, the body was not moving. Knowing that something was wrong, the boy rushed back home to tell his mother what he had seen, and in response, she called the police to conduct a wellness check on the family. After arriving at the residence, it became clear to authorities that something awful had happened. The door was unlocked, and the house was eerily silent. Police officers began their search in the basement, and there they found the bodies of Deborah and Mark Richardson. They were both dead on the ground, motionless in a pool of their own blood. Sadly, Deborah had been stabbed 12 times in the chest, and as for Mark, he had suffered 24 lacerations and punctures to the chest and back. The horrors of what police would discover did not stop there, as sadly, after entering Tyler's bedroom, they too found his lifeless body in his bed. Blood covered his bed sheets and the surrounding stuffed animals he often took to bed. The young boy had been stabbed five times, and his throat had been cut. Scouting the crime scene, police took note of the family pictures scattered around the house, which depicted a family of four. And of course, this begged the question, where was their daughter, Jasmine? It was immediately assumed that these murders were the result of a home invasion, and quite possibly, Jasmine had been abducted by the very person or people who murdered her family. An Amber Alert was put in force for the missing teenager, and police began preliminary work in their search for the missing 12-year-old girl. This started with her friends and her school. Authorities were given access to Jasmine's school records, which included her locker, but what they uncovered inside suggested an entirely different scenario. Amongst her school supplies and books, authorities found a drawing, a stick figure comic portraying a family going for a walk. One of the family then retreats to Jeremy's truck, where they collect gasoline and pour it onto the other three family members. They then set the three ablaze, drawing out their pain and agony. With the discovery of this drawing, authorities decided to treat Jasmine's disappearance as suspicious, and with Jeremy's name in the picture, they were very keen to find out who he was. It didn't take long for several leads to come through either, as soon after questioning several of Jasmine's friends, authorities were able to identify the man as Jeremy Allen Steinke. They told of how he doted on her, and did anything to keep her attention. And to make things even more concerning, they were even able to tip authorities that Jasmine had often talked about killing her own parents. Following these tips, combined with a trail of digital evidence, including messages, emails, and chat logs, investigating officers were able to theorize a very harrowing motive. The news of the suspected killer couple hit the headlines far and wide, and the small community of Medicine Hat was uproared in shock and disgust. This publicity would be the couple's downfall, as shortly after this, they were spotted at a gas station less than 100 miles away. They had spent the last 24 hours chilling with friends, all of whom were entirely unaware of their evil actions. Or, at least they didn't take them seriously. I say this because Jeremy and Jasmine were actually laughing about how they had just killed her family, and even shared accurate details about how they had done it. They all thought this was some sort of sick joke, but after seeing newspaper headlines, those friends informed the police immediately, and eventually, Jeremy's truck was successfully tracked in a field where the pair had spent the last night together. After fully surrounding the truck, authorities arrested both Jasmine Richardson and Jeremy Steinke on suspicion of triple murder. The pair seemed unbothered by the news, and only annoyed. But with the two now in custody, officers could thoroughly interrogate them and hopefully learn about what exactly happened on the night of April the 22nd. And it didn't take long for them to start talking. 
It appears that neither of their love was strong enough for the other, as Jeremy confessed that Jasmine had begged him to help get rid of her parents by any means necessary, and since he would supposedly do anything to keep her, he agreed. In parallel to this, Jasmine quickly threw Jeremy under the bus by describing him as the sole perpetrator of the crime. She claimed that she was only hypothetically talking about killing her family, thought it all to be a joke, and never intended to follow through with the plan. But Jeremy's claims seemed to check out better than Jasmine's own version of events. And all of this was backed up by a long digital trail of evidence showing that the pair had both stuck to their plan. And of course, there was one big question that everyone wanted to know. What precisely was their conniving scheme? It all started on the night of April 22nd. Jasmine secretly let Jeremy into the house under the cover of night. She then quietly retreated upstairs while Jeremy made his way to the basement. And here, while Deborah was doing the laundry, he found her. Taking a six-inch folding knife in hand, Jeremy launched himself onto Jasmine's mother, stabbing her multiple times in the chest. But this altercation did not go unnoticed, and in the process, Mark awoke to hear his wife screaming for help. He hastily ran towards the basement, and when he got there, he was met with the sight of his wife on the floor, and a strange balaclava-wearing man standing over her. The pair began to wrestle as Mark tried to steal the knife from the intruder, but sadly, he failed in this task. And the fight ended with Mark receiving multiple stab wounds to his chest and back. Tragically, as he lost consciousness, he could only mutter one word to Jeremy. A question. And that was why. Jeremy replied with a harrowing and heartbreaking answer. Because your daughter wanted it that way. Mark passed away shortly after this. As all of this was happening, Jasmine was upstairs in her room. It was planned that during this time, she would take the life of her own younger brother, who was sleeping soundly in his bedroom. Now, Jeremy's and Jasmine's version of events differ quite significantly here. Jeremy claims that Jasmine had killed her brother all by herself, and that he had nothing to do with it. But Jasmine, on the other hand, testified that after struggling to kill him with her own hands, Jeremy encouraged her to take the knife on her own little brother. Jasmine eventually admitted to stabbing her brother, but apparently it was only once, and weakly if you could use that word to describe it. It was evident, however, that Tyler had been stabbed a total of five times with a deep laceration to his throat. Jeremy then left the house, leaving Jasmine all alone in the home with her now deceased family, and shortly after this, she then hailed a taxi to Jeremy's trailer. During court proceedings, the taxi driver described how the young girl he had picked up was unfazed. She cheerfully greeted him as if nothing seemed out of the ordinary, and certainly not like a child that had just lost her entire family. Once reunited, the pair spent the next 24 hours together, and during this time frame, they expressed a severe lack of remorse. They were spotted cuddling and kissing in a restaurant before visiting friends and bragging about their actions, and even after their arrest, their atrocious behaviour continued. Strangely enough, but the pair were given permission to send letters to each other, Maybe this was for authorities to see if they could find any more clues out of what they were saying to each other. And of course, between these letters, Jeremy asked Jasmine to marry him. Now the two are clearly as crazy as each other, because Jasmine accepted his proposal. And remember, this was after Jasmine claimed that Jeremy was the sole murderer of this crime. Disgusting side notes aside, but one year later, in June 2007, the pair were separately put on trial for the murders of the Richardson family. Since Jeremy was an adult, he was put under the full force of the law. His defence argued that he was a weak-willed, immature man with low self-esteem, and his history of abuse at the hands of his mother's lovers was to blame for his actions. His defence also argued that Jeremy was desperate for affection, and wanted the innocent love of a 12-year-old to fill the void left in his childhood. Even his own friends testified he would have done anything to keep her affection. Needless to say, being weak-willed and having low self-esteem is hardly an excuse to murder three innocent people, or be a groomer. And rightfully so, Jeremy was given three life sentences for the murders he had committed. He will be eligible for parole after serving 25 years. Due to Jasmine's age at the time, she was kept anonymous throughout her trial, and all court proceedings only referred to her as JR. But with the long trial of digital clues left before the murders, and her actions both before and after the fact, Jasmine was also found guilty of murdering her mother, brother, and father. Her lack of remorse was evident, and how she conducted herself when giving her testimony expressed a severe lack of empathy. To add to this, she was even caught smiling when describing how her own family died. 
This is where things get a little tricky, but due to her age, the maximum penalty she could possibly receive under Canadian law was only 10 years. Not only that, but those 10 years also include psychiatric care, a shared home, and monitored living, all of which are not taken behind bars. And in fact, while serving her time, she was eventually paraded as a model example of rehabilitation. Through therapy and detachment from Jeremy, she began to express a genuine remorse for her actions, and those responsible for her care were confident she would never reoffend again. Justice Scott Brooker expressed his hope that Jasmine was now a changed person. He stated, I think your parents and brother would be proud of you. Clearly, you cannot undo the past. You can only live each day with the knowledge you can control what you do and how you behave each day. For the last five years of her sentence, Jasmine attended Mount Royal University in Calgary, under a new name to reintegrate into society. She was released in 2016, and since then has continued to live amongst the public. On the other hand, Jeremy still resides behind bars, which is probably for the best, as the man was clearly a predator even before becoming a murderer. The sentencing in this case is often a point of contention. There's a mantra that many argue about when discussing this story. If you're old enough to do the crime, then you're old enough to do the time. And although many believe that Jasmine should have received much more time behind bars, she was just a child who had been manipulated by a deranged man. Since Jasmine remained out of trouble for five years after being released, her criminal record has been expunged, meaning no trace of her previous crimes exist on her criminal record. She likely goes by an entirely different name now too, free to live her life without any limitations. Mark and Deborah Richardson were loving parents looking out for their daughter. Any parent would have been horrified to learn of Jasmine's situation. They loved and cared for their daughter, and only wanted to keep her safe. But sadly, both of them, along with Jasmine's younger brother Tyler, were murdered in the face of an illegal, disgusting love affair. Jeremy will never see the light of day again, and Jasmine will have to live with her guilt for the rest of her life, which I imagine is a punishment all in its own right. The community of Medicine Hats have refused to welcome her back, and of course the town is still scarred by the event. Honestly, I'm not sure what to think about Jasmine's sentence. Ten years is a very short time, considering the weighting of her actions. But then again, she was only 12 years old, and had been groomed by a 23-year-old. Canada's judicial system is very different to the rest of the world, where some places like the US believe in punishing people, for Canada it's all about reformation. I mean, there is the argument that some people are just born monsters, and although Jasmine was only 12 years old, she did kill her entire family. So, can she be trusted after she's released from prison? Honestly, I am really on the fence with this one, as there are arguments both for and against this early release. So, what are your thoughts on this case? Anyhow, I'm going to wrap this one up, folks. So thank you so much for watching another video today by Coffeehouse Crime. If you found this case interesting or you learned something new today, then please remember to like the video and subscribe if you haven't yet. It really does help the channel out. I'll be seeing you again very soon for another video, but until that moment arrives, please remember to look after each other and of course, stay safe. Thank you and goodbye. Is it time for another Nero blooper? Hmm, it's been like three videos, so probably. You don't care, you've just woken up from a sleep, from a nap, hmm? Why am I here? This guy's really tired, aren't you? Yeah, he's tired. Huh? Yeah, no, it's not.